Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jackie Reardon. I lead the client marketing efforts at Franklin Templeton, and I'm very honored today to be joined by my friend and colleague, Peter Capinos, head of workplace marketing at Empower. Peter, hello. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us. So just a quick game plan for what we'll cover today. Um, Franklin Templeton and Empower both have uh, fresh new research and insights and very complementary studies. Um, our Voice of the American Worker study, which I will share uh, first, um, is all about what employees say they want, their sentiment, um, and Empower, obviously with their robust participant network, is able to come right behind that and tell us what they're actually doing and how they're actually acting. So, so happy to be joined by Peter today. Um, as I mentioned, I'll take the first uh, few moments of today's session to share the latest Voice of the American Worker research study, which is a study that Franklin Templeton conducts each year with the Harris Poll. Um, and then Pe uh, Peter will share the Empowering America's Financial Journey research study as well. So let's get right into the details. Once we're done sharing our research as well, um, we would love to take as many questions as, as possible. So feel free to share those throughout the session, and then we'll compile at the end and, and do our best to, to address any comments, feedback, questions that you might have. So the Voice of the American Worker Survey, this is actually the third year that we have conducted this research on behalf of the Harris Poll. And, and as you'll see, we're actually, we were recognized towards the end of last year by wealthmanagement.com uh, with an award. So very happy um, to have that recognition. This year, you'll also no notice in the blue subtext um, a, a theme for this year's research, which is financial anxiety reshaping expectations for benefits. So. Um, safe to say, participants are feeling some pressure in today's economic climate. Um, so we'll, we'll go through some of the challenges that they're facing and hopefully plenty of opportunities for support. Here is just a quick summary of, of what we'll cover here today. Um, first and foremost, the current economic climate is accelerating financial stress amongst participants, workers, and we'll, and we'll get into the nitty gritty of, of what that stress actually looks like. Uh, next, we'll take a look at um, what American workers are actually doing. So the impact of the current economic environment is changing some of their plans, and we'll see some of the behaviors they're taking. And then in part three, very importantly, we'll share how um, workers are turning to employers for support, um, particularly more personalized support um, to really improve their well-being across all areas, financial, physical, and mental. Just a quick background on the methodology here. So we fielded this research at the very end of this past calendar year. Um, this includes results from 1,000 US employed adults. And as you can see by the breakdown of ages and regions, this is a really nice snapshot of what the, uh, the current US workforce looks like. Um, just a, a quick note, uh, as we go through, I'll make mention of some trends we're seeing now that we're in year three of this research. And also where we have an emphasized result in a specific age group, uh, which we have plenty of those. Um, and in fact, the millennial generation, which uh, just as a side note, is actually the largest segment of the US workforce. We see some emphasis throughout, so I'll, I'll make note of those as well. So we've seen some evergreen trends in our last three years of research, and, and here we have them captured. So workers are continuing to seek improve, improved well-being across all areas, but there's some roadblocks getting in the way. Um, improving financial health is, is definitely top of mind for most, and there's a, a huge opportunity for employer support. Uh, we're also seeing that workers are remaining more focused on the concept of financial independence versus the concept of traditional retirement. Um, and then obviously for employers, it's a huge opportunity to reevaluate the benefit offering, really the total benefit offering, to make sure that you're meeting the needs of employees um, in improving the well-being across the board. So just to set the stage quickly, there's been a, a lot going on since the last time we fielded our research. Uh, inflation is at um, the highest it's been in the last four decades. We had the sixth most volatile year we've seen since the Great Depression. Um, performance was down 25% last year for the S&P 500. And um, you know, all of our indicators are flashing red as it relates to a possibility uh, of a, a recession right, right around the corner. So I think with that backdrop, we can understand that um, employees are feeling some economic-related stress. 
We're also seeing trends shift in the workforce as well. So the, the great resignation, the thing we talked so much about last year, and I'm sure all of you were bombarded with webinar invites and articles related to addressing the great resignation, it has shifted. It has shifted for sure. In fact, 66% of employees we um, asked mentioned that this current economic environment actually encourages them to stay with their current employer. 47% said they've actually seen a colleague or know someone who went back to an old job in the past five years. And 37% admitted that they've, they themselves have returned to a job in the last five years. Those last two stats are actually emphasized for the youngest two uh, generations, millennials, Gen Z, et cetera. So who knows what we'll call this phase, the great return, the great boomerang, I've heard a call, but it's fair to say that the great resignation has definitely um, wound down. All in all, regardless of those evergreen trends, sort of the short-term economic pressures, the workforce shift in trends, we see year after year that financial independence is the number one goal amongst our respondents. This year, in fact, up 5%, 81% said, I am more focused on becoming financially independent. And that, um, with the help of the Harris Poll, we define as having enough money to live comfortably and not have to rely on somebody else um, or, or to have um, income from a job. So, so all of our research is really about how do we help employees seek um, that, that um, ultimate goal of financial independence. As I mentioned in um, part one, we are seeing that employees are feeling the stress of the economic environment. And here's where we'll dig in a couple, next couple slides around how employees feel. So 66% say that they are definitely feeling those negative um, effects of the current environment. And it's showing up in very specific ways. So they're saying that they feel anxious about the future. They're having trouble sleeping. They're having difficulties with their personal life relationships. Um, they're having trouble falling asleep. 22% admitted that they feel distracted at work. But if you can see that little um, gray that right above it, the youngest generation, that's actually emphasized. So 30% admit to feeling distracted at work. So this isn't just something that they're feeling when they're at home. They're bringing these negative feelings to work. Um, I think the distracted at, at work stat is pretty interesting too, because those are just the ones that admitted to it. So you can imagine how many uh, are feeling distracted but are just not admitting to it. Stress levels across all three areas of well-being, which we define as physical, mental, and financial are up. But importantly, we're seeing that financial well-being or lack thereof is impacting the other areas, so mental and physical. You'll see that on the left-hand side. 79% say my mental health is affected by my financial health. And 73% say my physical health is affected by my financial health. So that's some really interesting confirmation that we can't just look at financial stress in a silo. It's coming with people to work and it's impacting other areas of their well-being as well. As I mentioned earlier, financial independence continues to be the number one financial concern, but we see plenty of other financial concerns here as well. Of note, uh, debt is definitely a, a huge concern. It's up 7% year over year, which is not surprising given that credit card debt is actually at a 20 year high. And many folks still haven't paid off their holiday debts and I don't mean this past holiday, I mean the one before that. So 2021, people are still dealing with those, those um, holiday fees. And then this financial stress is showing up in other ways around feelings of instability. So 64% say my ability to reach financial independence um, is under attack. People feel that they're, um, uh, they're 61% say their retirement plans, they don't feel any stability in those. And then there's 49, so almost half of respondents say they, they don't feel any stability in their job as well. And there, it, this is also altering people's plans too. So particularly as it relates to inflation and soaring living expenses, people admitted that, that that's making them consider changes to their, um, their later years, their retirement years. 63% said it's actually um, altering my ability to retire early. So all in all, if we, if we, again, think about that section as how American workers are feeling, they're not feeling great. They're feeling financial stress, and it's impacting other areas of their well-being, namely their mental well-being and their physical well-being. They're bringing that to them at work, 
And it's definitely a huge time for employers to check in and get back in front of employees with probably a, a lot of tools and resources you already have. Um, and if you don't already have them, perhaps it's a, it's a great time to consider what support can be offered to employees to get them out of this, this huge feeling of stress. So if those last couple slides were all about how workers are feeling, the next couple slides are about what they're doing, the actions they're taking because of that stress. And namely, they're delaying retirement, specifically by three years. So we, I just want to highlight how we asked this question. We asked people very specifically, before this economic environment, when were you planning to retire? And after this economic environment, when are you planning to retire? And they mentioned that that age has gone from 62 to 65. Um, and you might be thinking to yourself, because I did too when I first saw this stat, well, people are living longer, but they are not. Um, life expectancy has actually decreased in the last couple of years. So specifically, this current environment is, make, is making people really uh, think about delaying retirement. Interestingly, and perhaps a breadcrumb for later, um, employ, employees said that if my employer offered post-retirement benefits, 69% said they would consider retiring early. Let's take a little bit of a deeper look into the day-to-day -day financial behaviors that workers are taking related to this economic stress. I think the good news here in the next couple of slides we'll see is that employees are actually getting more involved. So they're not, you know, putting their head in the sand or kind of waiting for this, this storm to pass. They want to get more actively involved in managing their finances. And that's showing up in some very specific ways. Number one, they're cutting spending, which makes complete sense in this inflationary environment. Um, not surprising, but of concern, number two, you'll see they're looking for a side hustle. So, you know, I know we, we live in a gig economy, et cetera, but I think for any employer to know that their employees are looking for a second job, um, it's definitely of note. They're delaying purchases. They're re-examining their financial providers. Um, they're thinking about taking out a loan, et cetera, trying, trying to find a new job as well. Um, so. Just to give a snapshot of what people are doing with their day-to-day -day finances. On top of that, if we think more specifically to how they are thinking about their retirement-related financial behaviors, we see at the very top of that list, 57% are contributing to their retirement account, which is great, great news. We also talked about the fact that they're delaying retirement, but there's a couple other things they're doing here that I think are of concern and perhaps, again, maybe some breadcrumbs for us to think about tying the thread back to tools, resources we can make available. So they're re-examining providers. They are moving money to cash. Um, they're thinking about taking a loan or distribution from their retirement accounts, borrowing against it, et cetera. So I think, again, some breadcrumbs for us to consider about new things that are even more available now, as we will talk about later, um, related to Secure 2.0. And then not only are their behaviors changing, but they're really re rethinking about their later years. So 58% say, I plan on working during retirement. 47% uh, said, I increased my retirement savings contribution, but I just want to highlight right next to that, we see that the folks who say that they have decreased their retirement savings is uh, emphasized for those in lower income, the lower income group, and also women. And then 65% say, I really want a concrete plan. And I think this is the theme we're continuing to see. People want a plan, they want guidance, and they want advice. 65% this year said, I want a concrete plan for later years. That's up 13% since we started this research. So again, those last couple of slides are all about what employees are doing, the behaviors they're taking because of the economic environment and the stress that they're feeling. Um, employees are definitely seeking more direction, advice, um, and thankfully they're, they're staying engaged. So it's a perfect opportunity for us to, to engage with them. Um, if perhaps engagement strategies have not worked in the past, this is the perfect opportunity to re-engage because we have an audience that's, that's way more um, open to guidance and, and resources. So now next couple of slides, we'll just talk about some of the tools and resources that employers can consider. And again, a lot of the things that will um, sort of tee up as takeaways that have become more available with Secure 2.0. The, the Cliff Notes version is that people are looking for more holistic support. 70% say when it comes to benefit, 
more holistic options are needed. And we define that as holistic support that ex, um, ex, assesses, excuse me, assesses all financial goals together. So not just speaking to employees as future retirees, but instead speaking to them and supporting them as holistic beings who have many, many different uh, financial goals um, and needs. Um, we, we also, not only do they want that support, but it matters to them when their employers provide that. So they, seven in 10 say, it really matters to them that their employer addresses things like the current economic situation. 68% say they feel taken care of. And 59% say, I count on my employer to help me navigate the turbulent economic climate. And then a quick snapshot of some of the things that they're really looking for. So as I mentioned, employees want to be involved. They're getting more engaged. Nine and 10 say they have taken steps to navigate the economic uncertainty. Number one thing on that list they're looking for is to speak to a financial advisor, a financial coach. They want tools and guidance. They're looking for plenty of other things like tax guidance, how to budget, managing debt. They're really interested in automating their savings, so things like auto enrollment, auto escalation. Um, and 72% say, I want to be able to easily adjust my plan given the current economic um, climate. And they're looking for more personalized solutions. So my favorite stat on this slide is right in the middle. 77% of respondents said, more personalized 401k investment options would encourage them to participate and contribute more to their retirement savings. Last but not least, we, we ask this question every single year, what are the benefits that if your employer had extra money you would like to see added or improved upon? Um, every year we see things like increase my pay and increase the 401k match at the very top of the list. It's not surprising to anyone, I'm sure, that increased pay is, is up significantly given the inflationary environment. Um, but the rest of this checklist, I think, is, is, is a great place for most employers to start to think about really evaluating that tonal benefit option um, options because we see a lot of other things here as benefits that employees are interested in. So things like putting my money into an investment that would become a guaranteed income option, um, access to a health savings account, access to emergency savings account, help with my student loans, help saving for my kids' um, college education. So a lot of things to think about and consider. And as I mentioned, many of these things um, are more readily available to employers to provide to employees given recent legislation. All in all, it's all about really helping to support employees and reaching this ultimate goal, which is financial independence. And as I mentioned, you know, next steps to consider, and I know Peter will, will dive into this a bit, a bit more as well, but there's so many new opportunities with Secure 2.0. I know we're all still digesting it. Um, Empower's got lots of great content, which I know Peter will mention around how, how you, to help you digest this. Uh, there's things that are available today, will be available soon. So it's just chock full of all the, and it ties back very nicely to a lot of the benefits and resources that employees are looking for. I mentioned uh, evaluating your communication plan. There's probably plenty of tools and resources you already have available that you just need to re-communicate back to employees. And maybe now they're finally kind of open to um, that engagement. Partnering with a trusted financial professional. So if the, the idea of Secure 2.0 or evaluating your total benefits is totally overwhelming, it's fine. There's experts out there that will be happy to partner with you and help you through that. Reviewing providers. There's, there's great providers out there that have such great new tools, even your current provider, new tools and resources that you can leverage. Um, evaluating plan design. Again, I think that ties back to Secure 2.0. And then surveying your workforce. So the, the survey that I've gone through that Franklin Templeton conducted and the one that Peter will go through that Empower conducted are great, but then also if you don't already, kind of surveying your own workforce to get a better um, feel for how the specifics of, of that group, I think that's super important. We have plenty of tools and resources that can help you do that. Um, and happy to, to, to talk about those as, as we get deeper in. But Peter, let me, let me turn it over to you so that you can go on and, and share your great resources and then we can talk about some more resources after this. Sounds great, thanks Jackie. Can you hear me okay? Terrific. Um, I am, full disclosure, I had a little, a little bit of a technical thing here where, where I was getting connectivity. So if for a moment I go out of screen, 
you can carry the slide for me, okay? <laughs> you got it. Um, okay. So let me just introduce for everyone, first of all, by background, if you're not familiar with Empower, we are a retirement service provider that were founded just eight years ago. So where the marketplace probably didn't need another record keeper, we were formed through the combination of actually several uh, record keepers to create what is now the industry's second largest workplace retirement plan provider. So chances are that if you're playing, if you're in the small plan market, you're in the governmental plan market, you know, all sorts of different industries, we provide 401k services. They are serving about 17 million individuals. And so we kicked off this research program, which we call Amer uh, Empowering America's Financial Journey, with the idea that it would give a lens into what folks are actually doing. As Jackie said earlier, you know, we survey folks, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but sometimes it's good to compare and contrast what people say they're planning to do with what they're actually doing and looking at the behavior that's behind it. So this actual study you can find on Empower's website. We'll also provide a copy of it to you following the meeting because I'm going to go through just a portion. I want to say there's 50 or so or more pages of content. I'm not going to take you through all of those today. We just selected some insights that we thought were a good accompaniment to the things that Jackie covered. So let me first explain what's in America's financial journey or empowering America's financial journey. Um, we asked questions in the end of 2022 about how is the inflationary environment affecting you know, individuals' choices, their plans going forward, what's impacting their savings rates, how are advice and guidance, Jackie talked about it earlier, people saying, well, they want personalization, they want to talk to an advisor, how does that impact potential outcomes? But we also married together on the right-hand side some data. While we served 17 million individuals, we did a cut that was 4.3 million active participants. So we want to make sure these are folks who are you know, currently enrolled in the plan. We're focused for the purposes of this into our corporate space. There I saw in some registration, there were a few of you that were a government plan sponsors. We have a cut of this that's done for government workers, um, but we'll take you through some highlights today. But we also over-surveyed, we, while we took the data on 4.3 million, we then surveyed a couple, a few thousand of those individuals to try to figure out the why behind what they're doing. And I think you'll, you'll find the insights pretty interesting. So let me start with just at the highest level what you're going to hear from us today. Um, number one, it's probably not a surprise, Gen Z, simple math, you've got people joining the workforce, but the trend at which it is happening, how you think as a benefits professional to engage a new set of workers who are probably thinking they're wired a little differently, it becomes apparent in the decisions that are, that are being made. Um, inflationary pressure. Uh, the, the people are prioritizing short-term needs over long-term. But with shifting priorities, the third point, although people say they're thinking about maybe lessening, as Jackie showed, reducing savings for retirement, we're not yet seeing that really happening. You'll see there's a modest decrease. We'll show you that in just a couple of minutes. Engagement matters a lot. So for those of you who have put in place an auto enrollment program and you know it gets you to participation, it gets you to a baseline level of savings, we'll show you that there's no replacement for engagement in terms of confidence, in terms of getting people to their goals, in terms of using the features that are out there today. Um, finally, we'll talk about match. From a plan design, a lot of you put a lot of effort into the match formula that's provided. We'll talk about how that inspires certain savings rates and things to be conscious of. And then finally, we'll talk about how all of this pairs together, education and advice and engagement, how you can look at all these things in context, especially around the theme of financial wellness. So let me get started. One of the questions that we asked out of the gate was about daily finances. We asked questions about you know, how are you adjusting to the inflationary environment? And we gave you know, people a variety of radio buttons, and they're listed here. We categorized them in the dark blue of they've already done this. They plan to do this, or it's something that simply is not on the radar. So inflation's picking up. It's all over the headlines. We asked what you're going to do about it. Well, obviously, 50% of people said they're going to cut back on daily expenses. Nearly half saying they plan to create a budget, which is easier said than done. For those of you who have you know, explored financial wellness, you know you can put all these calculators and worksheets out there, but people have to actually fill them in, and will they necessarily do it? Um, cutting back on entertainment seems obvious. One of the ones that I think is interesting is as you go over and we squared it off here for you is contributing less to the retirement account. Only 13% of people say that they've done this. Another 12% said they plan to do this. 
let's go maybe to the far right. Actually, you compare this, the good thing about the workplace plans that all of you on this call sponsor is that people are steadfast savers. You actually have about the same number of people who are saying they're going to relocate to another city or another country is on par with the number who are going to reduce savings into your plan. So I think that's a good sign in terms of the confidence of, of what they're doing. So we compared then the data of what people said they might do and what they are actually doing. And what you can see here is, is that we trace this back to really the, the beginning of COVID, Q1 2020, uh, where you probably, a lot of you on this call, depending on the industry that you're in, you're in, you might have seen some people, you know, stopping savings a little bit, concerned about what to do next. Bottom line is, is that, you know, call it that 8% range is, is here and is strong. Um, we're not seeing a lot of people making changes. A lot of the shift really has to do with employee turnover. You know, you've had increases of employee turnover so that when those people come into a new plan, they're maybe defaulted at the automatic enrollment deferral rate, which might uh, lessen your average deferral into the plan. Uh, a little bit of, um, you know, commentary when we survey people, why would you decrease savings? It's the things you would expect. Making ends meet. I've got to pay back debt. I'm concerned about market volatility. So I'm going to pivot a little bit and talk about sort of some trends in terms of what we're seeing among employee populations, things around, you know, who's joining the workforce, what's happening with student loans, and a variety of things. So let me jump ahead a little bit here. I referenced it earlier, and here's just another color scheme way of looking at this. Um, this is an illustration of the average if we look at the empowered population, which is pretty representative of the workforce in general. If you look at where how this is playing out in the last couple of years, we now look at 40% of new hires and 30% of termina terminations, so net three, are Gen Z. More than a third have a tenure of less than one year, so a little bit of turnover as people experiment with jobs. They may not stay in a job for 30 plus years because they're experimenting with new things that's perhaps encouraged. Um, it's expected, however, to be 30% of the workforce by 2030. So if you haven't thought about hmm, how do we engage people who are perhaps less beholden to this first job or perhaps who use different forms of media to engage, something you might want to think about in terms of your employee benefit strategy. So let's pivot for a second here and talk about loans. Uh, I think all of you, if you were on this call, you remember a few years ago when the CARES Act provisions came out. You may or may not have implemented more flexibility and hardships and loans, depending on the industry that you're in. We are definitely seeing, and we've sort of normalized this, and power has grown quite a bit over the last couple of years, but we looked at just the same plan of uh, same base of participants. Well, the numbers aren't, aren't you know, hugely off the charts, but the bottom line is, is we are starting to see a, a pickup um, in terms of loans coming out of plants. Um, and I think, you know, especially with the SECURE Act coming on board, you know, potentially more provisions available, you'll probably see that continue. So I'm going to pivot here and talk for a minute about, as I said I would earlier, the concept of engagement. So what do we mean when we say engagement? You'll see defined, and, and we'll take you through for the next several pages, we define engagement as being people who have visited the web, our website, visited the mobile app, called into a, a, a call center at Empower. So on some level, they're paying attention to their money, they're, they're, they're getting involved, um, you know, spending a little bit of it. So we're going to talk a little bit about what's the impact of that, what's the impact if you can get people engaged early on. The idea of auto-enrollment is great, but if you tell people to set it and forget it, they're probably going to do just that, and we really need to get people engaged. Let's explain why. So first of all, the biggest single thing all of you probably have on this call is that we've got to get people to save more. So here is an illustration of people who are engaged in the red bar, people who are not engaged. So in other words, they haven't visited the website, they haven't been on the mobile app, they haven't called us in the last year. Look at the difference. It doesn't matter the income level that you are in. You could have a lot of disposable income, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to um, save more if you're not engaged. On average, engaged people are saving 56% more than those who are not engaged in, in your plan. One of them I'd like to call out that I think is pretty interesting, though, is, is if you follow over on the left, you've got um, the people making less than $60,000 a year. 
Not engaged, saving 5%, engaged, saving 7.9, nearly 8%. Roll across, though, to people making uh, 120,000, actually, with that, uh, I think we've got a little typo there, that should be a greater than 120,000. If you've got folks who are making more than double the income, if I'm an engaged employee saving 7.9, almost 8%, the unengaged making more than 120 or are save, saving just, just a hair more than that at 8.3. So again, across income bands, engagement makes a huge difference. So some of you may be looking at this and saying, we put the note on the, the slide here, women have similar engagement rates as men. So men and women, similar engagement rates. What you're actually starting to see here is where it becomes very apparent is that gender is a big role in this. So you can see men saving more than women with the exception of less than 60. So if you go across 60 to 90, 90 to 120,000, greater than 120,000 in income, the red bars, women, saving at higher rates than men. So when you look at the bar to the far right, women are actually saving on average a little less than men are. That's because of the proportion of women who are making um, less than $60,000 far outnumbers those uh, that men who are in that category. So let's advance a little bit here and, and transition to the topic of, you know, we mentioned earlier and Jackie referred to a people who have maybe they've changed jobs, they've gone back to old jobs, they're, you know, you know millennials or Gen Z are trying out new jobs. How does um, engagement impact, like if you can get people hooked early on, you know, people are busy, they join a new organization, they've got a lot of things to, to dig in on. There's no replacement for getting people engaged early on. This is just a snapshot of people who are not engaged at less than one year of eligibility, saving at 4.3 versus engaged at seven and a half. It's an 80% difference between the two. You, we also see some trends over on the right, you can see pointed out, determining their savings rate and leaving money on the table. We talked, I mentioned earlier things about match. Engaged participants, versus unengaged. 48% of the unengaged are not you taking full advantage of your match formula. So if they're not aware of it, if they're not engaged, they're not visiting the website, they're probably not aware that they're leaving money on the table. That number is barely one out of five if you've actually got people engaged. R related, we asked people, how do you determine their savings rates? 40% of people, it's based on the match. So it's important that you engage people because they will do, if you set the bar, they will get to the bar. So let me pivot a little bit to talk about, and, and, and uh, Jackie referenced it earlier, the importance of personalized advice, personalized strategies. How will people use them? What is the impact of them? And I think, Jackie, you referenced um, some things about you know, people saying that they would um, contribute more if they, were, if they had a personalized strategy. They would be more engaged. That's exactly what we are saying. When we look at how people are utilizing, for example, there's a little bit of an uptick. You know, over on the left, you can see people using professionally managed strategies. Maybe I should define what professionalized strategy means. A target date is, is a sort of a professional strategy. DIY is, you know, DIY. It's you're picking individual funds, what have you. Over on the right here is we kind of distinguish between a target date fund. Most of you are familiar with target date funds. You know, it's a mutual fund or a collective product that is set for the uh, estimated date of retirement. The participant doesn't really do anything. They're in a, the, the, the common thing for those individuals is they're expected to re retire within five or 10 years of each other. Or they're all in the same portfolio. The managed account, which might be available within your plan, is basically where the individual, you know, answers some questions about risk tolerances, other goals, other retirement savings that they have, and then a portfolio is created for them. So what we're seeing here is, is that um, people are more engaged. So you can see you're 78%, four out of five people are visiting their account. And part of that is, is because when you're in a managed account, what typically happens is the, the provider is sending you messages to update your information and to engage with it. So you're seeing higher engagement, but you're also seeing higher savings rates, 22% higher savings rates. Uh, so Jackie also referenced a moment ago about the importance of advice. Having somebody that you can talk to, particularly in times like now where markets might be uncertain, 
maybe you open up your statement and you see it didn't grow or perhaps a particular part of your portfolio dropped off, who can I turn to? Well, we asked questions of, do you have a financial advisor? And we didn't necessarily qualify, was it, I have quarterly face-to-face -face meetings with somebody in my neighborhood. It could have been an, an online advisor that you work with. We just said, is there somebody that you work with? Here you can see the bars of, of the difference between those who are saying they're do-it-yourselfers, I don't talk to an advisor, I'm going to figure this out on my own, versus someone who says, you know what, whether it's direction or validation, you can see the improvement of people who feel like they are more ready for retirement. They feel like they are more knowledgeable. They're more comfortable with the decisions that have been made. They feel more confident about tri uh, um, contributing enough. So... With that as backdrop, um, I'm going to spend a minute here talking about the concept of financial wellness. You know, Jackie referenced earlier, people are saying they wish their workplace plan was maybe a little bit more holistic. I think many of you probably on this call, I, I've seen numbers as high as 90% of plan sponsors saying they want to uh, offer a more enhanced financial wellness program. So at Empower, we believe firmly that you know the best solutions can come about when there's a combination of people, advice, and technology, and those three things really fit well together. So in the last year, we rolled out a new experience that basically does just that. Instead of saying financial wellness is a course in financial literacy or that everybody should have a budget, but they got to go figure it on their own, we actually embedded it into the 401k, the 457, the 403b website. So I'm going to quickly show you what we've done, but I, I'm showing it in the context of what you can expect when you've got people engaged uh, in these types of programs. So here's just a quick snapshot of the Empower. If, you're, if your plan is with Empower, this is what your website typically looks like. In the center of it, you see a forecast of retirement income. Those have become more commonplace in the marketplace. Obviously, you've got things like your balance. But I want to call to your attention over on the left-hand side here, if individuals decide to link accounts, they want to say, hey, I've got money at a prior employer or I've taken a loan out, we actually will put together a net worth statement for the individual. I'd also call out here that we have made it really easy for people to put together a budget. If they choose to link, we already, as their record keeper, as their provider, we get their payroll feed. We know what they're deferring into their 401k or 403b or 457. So we kind of have the start of that. But people can link things like credit card accounts and get better control of where they're spending their money. And, and, and are they on track? Can they find extra dollars in their budget? So we wanted to see kind of how people were responding to those types of tools. Um, and here's what this looks like. Now, for most of you on this call, the, the real goal of the plan is how do we get people to save more? So we took a look at the end of last year as to was this new experience? When we made financial wellness less about a calculator and more about something that lives real time, here's what we're saying. Back to the earlier point. Unengaged people saving 5.7. If they're engaged, they're saving 8.8. Eight. If they're using some sort of other parts of our financial wellness tools or, or calculators, they're at 9.4. But the people who have actually gone in and used those budgeting tools, they linked an account or tool, they're, they're using that dashboard, those are the highest deferral rates we're seeing. So an investment that Empower has made to try to make financial wellness not just a, a hot topic, but rather something that people can use, get their hands on, engage with is, is totally paying off. So I wanted to wrap with, and um, Jackie referenced it just a few minutes ago, it's an interesting timing for us to have this webcast because we're all exploring and trying to figure out what's in the minds of employees, what can we do about it. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with the SECURE Act of 2022 is now in market. If you haven't explored it, we'd encourage you to do so. And we will push out to you um, following this call our summary of that. So if you haven't had a chance to explore it, there's a provision summary. So it's things that you need to be aware of, such as if you were setting up a new plan, you have to have automatic enrollment. You can if you choose to match student loan payments. You're going to be required to have catcher provisions for people making more than $145,000 to be in the form of a Roth. So as uh, in our efforts to try to keep uh, plan sponsors like you informed about what's going on, some of these provisions are actually optional. So there are things that you might need to think about. Gee, do I need to offer this to my employees? 
will other employers like me be doing it? If I need to, if I'm going to be competitive in a hiring into technology field or in a manufacturing field, do I need to offer provisions like distributions from the 401k for birth or adoption, long-term care insurance? So you're going to see in the chat function, we're going to send to you, and we'd encourage you to just click on it. It's a really short survey. We'll share with you the results of it broken out by plan sponsors like you. So if you just answer a few questions about what you're intending to do with CARES, we're going to publish the results, sort of create a community where you can find out about what plan sponsors like you are doing with the, uh, with the provisions. So I'm going to turn it over, and I think we've got probably some time here for, for questions that are in the chat. Um, Jackie, do you want to kick us off? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I um, would encourage everyone to um, add in, in any questions. And um, Peter, maybe I can just start, maybe we can both answer this question. Um, what sort of compelled Empower to do this type of research now? Um, I know this is the, the second year that you've done the in, Empowering America's Financial Journey research, and you have other research as well, but was there sort of a catalyst or uh, a plan for for a pulse you had on the industry that you felt compelled to do the, the research when you did it. Yeah, thanks, Jackie, for asking. So, you know, we, as you mentioned, you know, it, you hate to see, you know, you have an opportunity that's presented to, to add things that are timely. So our goal with Empowering America's Financial Journey is that every year we publish this study. But what we want to try to do is to make it really relevant and timely. So you couldn't miss the opportunity at the end of 2022 to address the topic of inflation. How is it impacting people? What are they doing to defend against it? The topic of loans, we've got some new content about how do you address you know, upticks in loans. Um, so it's very much something that guides what we're messaging to clients in addition to, to what's in the white paper in the survey. Great, yeah. I know for us, um, you know, this is the third year we've done this This. Uh, survey and you know as I mentioned on the at the beginning one of the reasons I love talking specifically to you about your research is because it marries so well we don't have participant information like you you all do you have a wealth of knowledge based on what participants are actually doing we can only ask what people say they might do um, but we we also felt kind of compelled in the last couple of years to help um, provide to the industry a, a data set. You know, there's a lot of anecdotes people sort of assume about participant behavior or what employees want, what they don't want, et cetera. Um, and again, you know, I think sometimes it's sort of assumed based on a specific industry or maybe a specific region of the country, but we felt like we would, it would be great for us to do our part um, to just provide a data set. And now that we have a couple of years of research, we're able to see trends and, and provide that out to, to the industry to help hopefully plan sponsors kind of have some insights on how perhaps they can they can help support employees. Yeah. I do see another question here, Jackie, and I know that um, uh, Franklin Templeton has done a lot of, of uh, content around integrating HSAs and HRAs and so on. Um, there is a question about how do you help employees utilize all the accounts um, you know, that are available to them. Um, you know, maybe I'll hit on that from a retirement provider perspective, which is to say, you know, we need to stop looking at them in silos. Um, mm -hmm. So on the Empower website, for example, if your HSA is with us and we offer an HSA, but we've certainly learned that if you, you know, if you do an annual benefits enrollment and people think that November is the time that you sign up for an HSA and they think it's like an old, um, uh, you know, flexible spending account or FSA, so they think it's spend as you go. These things are living separately and they don't necessarily see the whole picture. I'll just share with you that in, from Empower's perspective, you know, we can record keep these together so that, for example, when an employee um, logs in, they can actually see, and actually I think I might be able to go back here and just show you a picture of what that looks like. Um, you, know, you can see in this visual that when you pair together the 401k, You've got a little slider here that shows how much um, you can expect in the future on the HSA. I can't expand it here because this is just an image, but if I were to expand this, you can make your HSA deferral changes the same place you did the retirement. Mm -hmm. What we are seeing is significantly higher. I want to say 140% uh, higher participation in HSA, nearly double, double the deferrals. And that's because we've sort of not made it that HSA sits over here, the 401k sits over here, the non-qual plan is, is all over there. If you bring it all together, people can make one set of decisions 
And particularly for the HSA, they then start to view it as a long-term savings account, not just a spend as you go. So Jackie, I know you've done some work on, on HSA as well. Thoughts there? Yeah, you know, and I, I think such a great point you you brought up, and and I love I love the um, user experience you showed earlier too. I, I think the more you can make it easy for folks, not only from understanding what what each account does, um, but also uh, remove any barriers to access them. For us, it's it's all about education. So you know, we partner with with folks like Empower. Um, we don't provide accounts like that. We can only help sort of rally the troops and, and educate. But I, I do think that we we have a huge responsibility as an asset manager to provide education tools to help um, investors, employees, plan sponsors, financial advisors really put all of those things into context, um, particularly, again, as an asset manager in today's market environment. So why are, why are those always a good thing? And then why are they specifically a, an important thing to consider um, in today's market environment? I think we talk a lot about personalization too and how, you know, the, just going back to the user experience you showed earlier is we have really great, easy, personalized experiences in other areas of our life. So um, to not have it in our financial life is sort of a crime. So the, the more tools and, and user experiences like you showed, um, that we can make available to more people, the easier it'll be for them to um, click and choose what, what they need in a very goal-based um, um, and personalized way. Um, right. looks, like, looks like we have another question here about catch-up contributions. Um, and I know, Peter, that you all are going to share out some, some specific details. Um, so not sure if we want to, um, we have the details to answer that. Yeah, I can try to hit on it on a, on a base level. And, okay. um, you know, I would encourage everyone that we just sent out, there's a grid that explains all the terms of, of Secure 2.0. Um, you know, the, the concept here is, is that starting in starting next year, if you make more than $145,000, your catch-up provision, you know, as if you're eligible for catch-up, that has to go into Roth. So I think that kind of ask, answers the, the question. It's, it's if you are eligible for catch-up, you know, you're over age 50, and you make a more than 145, that's where it has to go on in, into a Roth. But again, the details of that are in the attachments that are here. Um, and if you, if for some reason that that uh, pop-up didn't come through, um, we can get that to you after the call. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I d just props to, to Empower again for um, easily articulating what was just a monster of a regulatory document. And I think um, even somebody who's probably super familiar with leg reg details all the time. Even I, I spoke to an ERISA lawyer and it was even hard to synthesize and, and summarize. So that's just going back to that um, recommendation to partner with experts and partner with financial professionals, record keepers and the like who um, have done the great job of summarizing and, and really synthesizing what the key takeaways are for as, as you know, uh, plan sponsors and employers. Um, there's a question here about um, challenges associated with fiscal spending and impulse spending and how that leads to poor savings for future benefits. I think I think so much of um, that question, there, there's so many ways to slice and dice it. You know, I think what we're finding um, and why you see wellness and well-being in the media for the last um, several decades is because um, I think as an industry, we've done a pretty good job of really hammering home the, the idea that you have to save for retirement and, and you should start to save early, whether or not people have done that or not. But I, I think they get the point where I think as an industry, there's a huge opportunity for us to really better engage as, a, as across all areas of well-being. You know, so kind of going back to the point I made around holistic support and holistic benefits, I think most employees are, are saying, yes, I, I get it. I should save for retirement, but please help me with some of the other hierarchical of financial needs I have. So help me pay down my student loan debt. Help me figure out what emergency savings um, looks like for me and my family. Help me with my credit cards. Help me think about budgeting. Um, help me save for my my ch children's education. So um, there's a lot of higher hierarchy of needs that people have financially. And instead of just engaging folks just on retirement, really thinking about the education and tools and resources that they need across the full spectrum um, of financial needs. And, and again, I think that, that that also goes back to what we both found in our research, that people need advice and guidance and support. And that can come in a lot of different ways, whether that's a person, whether that's a tool, a calculator, um, a personalized view of their own financial picture. But they need 
they really need that full view and not just a view of what retirement looks like. Because again, you know, our research is showing that the traditional concept of retirement actually isn't quite what most people are looking for. So that traditional concept of perhaps just stopping working at a specific age where everyone stops to work and then go on and, and do whatever it is that retirees do, but a little bit more of a nuanced and personal aspect. So we just have to engage people across that full spectrum. Yeah, I would I would add to that. I think, um, you know, the, the question as it was asked, you know, about people making impulse spending, you know, plans for future benefits. Um, having worked with a lot of individual participants and participant campaigns who use the R word, um, which is that I thought if I'm a Gen Z, and we just talked about that 40% of new hires are Gen Z, retirement is potentially 40 mm -hmm. years away. Exactly. It's a lifetime and a half away. So as you think about communicating employee benefits to that audience, think about it as in the realm of you know savings, financial freedom, because retirement's a long time away, but being able to get control of your finances, leveraging financial wellness tools to get people to save is probably a more powerful message than safer retirement, because it is a lifetime and a half away. Yeah, that's a super great point. And um, I, I don't believe I covered it today, but in our research, we also see that many employees are, they're actually looking to employers to provide incentives for good financial behavior. So, you know, if you think about many corporate environments have done, um, you know, step challenges or like health challenges before or provided, you know, free yoga classes or meditation challenges, things like that. Um, but I'm not sure that most um, employers have thought through perhaps what that might look like on the financial side. So uh, giving some incentive to employees to do a financial checkup or uh, marrying a financial checkup with annual enrollment, you know, where people are already engaged in another area of their life. So thinking about the role that employers can play in helping, to your point, sort of, you know, think about the younger generation and what's sort of top of mind for them financially versus um, perhaps those who are, who are nearer to retirement. Um, all right. Any last calls for questions in the chat? Um, Peter, I don't know if there's any closing thoughts you had or any uh, other questions you've gotten on this research that maybe you wanted to share to close things out. Uh, no, I think that covers much of it. I, I would just wrap with and just a, um, a reminder to folks, you, SECURE is here. There's some revisions that you have to do, so you, you kind of need to understand it a little bit. We did make available um, the, our summaries of it from Empower, um, but if you don't already have the link, we'll send it to you for that survey because just letting us know a little bit of what you're thinking, you know, nothing that we're going to do with it except for roll it up in the aggregate and and share with you on the on the follow up to help you benchmark, like you know, other manufacturing companies like me, other financial services companies like me, what are they doing in terms of, of secure deployment? So, if you participate in the in the survey, we'll be happy to send you the results so you can see uh, and use it for your advantage. Great, yeah, no, and and again, appreciate Peter you joining me today. So many great research resources that Empower has available. Franklin Templeton also has um, lots of great resources that we would be happy to help, including um, copies of our Voice of the American Worker research study, which is available to the public and online, um, some summary videos, a, a couple quick flyers, the full presentation, whatever you need. We want to share out this um, data and research in, in whatever way would be helpful to all of you. So um, we will close it there. And Peter, again, thanks so much for joining me. Really appreciate having us. Um, this conversation and I'm looking forward to engage with anybody who would like to follow up on our um, information today. Thank you so much.